My name is Michelle Lichman. I'm a nurse practitioner and assistant professor at the University of Utah. This is MJ Tran. She is the healthcare innovator, innovative manager at Granger Medical Clinic. And this is Perry Gee. He's the nurse scientist for Dignity Health. We're excited to be talking to you about transitions of care today. And when we say transitions of care, we talk about moving from one service facility to another. And that might include from hospital to home, but it also might include moving from a hospital to maybe an acute rehab center to home or to a nursing home to home. And so I think that there are more situations than just moving from a hospital to a home. One of the things I want to do is talk to you about my aunt, my aunt Mai Luang, who um, had breast cancer for several years. Um, she's with my other aunt here in this picture. And my aunt actually happens to be deaf. She's been deaf, deaf since childhood. And one of the things that really affected her care was communication. So when she was, had appointments for chemo and maybe something in the schedule had to be changed, there was no way to contact her and let her know about that. Or if she missed an appointment, they tried to call her using a telephone and not through an interpretation service. And so that really affected her care, which led to some hospitalizations. And when she got to the hospital, no one ever talked to her about how could, how could some of the, the missed appointments be prevented. And I think that had those questions been asked at, dis at hospital discharge, what could have been done differently so that you could have made it to your appointments? Or how can we communicate with you better so that um, we're not having this, um, this stream of missed visits? And so in the end, she ended up going from several times to the hospital. She was out of state, so I wasn't in a position to help her um, as much as I, sh as I could have. But I think that one of the interesting things was when she um, she actually had to have a brain sec resection because her brain cancer or her breast cancer had spread to her brain and that left her with paralysis on one side. And so now there's a deaf woman with paralysis on one side who can only communicate with one hand. And after she had moved to the, the acute rehab and it was determined that she couldn't um, be there any longer for services, they were planning a discharge to home. And it was just baffling to me that they're trying to get this woman home who doesn't have anyone that, she lives alone, and there wasn't any support provided, and there wasn't a lot of questions asked. And so I think with this presentation, we're trying to talk, have a discussion about how situations like this can be prevented. So as a nurse practitioner, I specialize in diabetes, and things can get messy. So from a clinician perspective, when I have a patient who might go into the hospital, let's say somebody with type 2 diabetes who might be on oral medications, and let's say they go in for um, a routine knee replacement. If they're on oral medications, they might end up being on insulin temporarily in the hospital. So let's say they go to an acute rehab facility to get to rehab their knee back, and they continue on that insulin, and then when they're discharged to home, they don't know what to do with this insulin. They were never educated or trained to use insulin, and so now there's this disconnect with what they're supposed to do, and they probably don't have insulin at home because they were never prescribed it in the beginning, and they don't know if they should go back to their oral medications, and so there's this huge disconnect with what happens once you move from a hospital setting to home. There's also this issue with... Um, electronic medical records and where data is. So moving from a paper chart scenario to a, an electronic uh, scenario has improved things, but that's only within a system. So if I work at an academic center, if my patient goes to other specialists within that academic center, then I have access to that information. But being in a specialty in endocrinology and diabetes, I have patients from other systems that come and see me, and I don't have access to their other records, and that can be quite problematic. One of our presenters was not able to make it today, Joe Nelson. Joe Nelson is a family physician, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the application that he wanted to talk about. So he is a full-time medical director for a hospice program, and in addition, he has a couple of different part-time practices that he does. And he's trying to balance this love for life and also taking great care of patients. And one of the things that he found was problematic is that he was 
constantly being tied to a fax machine, this archaic technology that really we've, we should be moved past. Um, he was having to be tied to finding a fax machine so that he could get orders from his hospice nurses um, to be signed because when you're in a hospice situation, you want to be able to make sure that people have access to medications right away. And so what he did was he developed an application called Airscripts that he uses with the, the home health agent, or excuse me, the hospice agency that he works with. And so wherever he is, whether he's snowboarding or mountain biking or on a trip to Mexico, he can easily take care of his patients wherever he is. I'm going to introduce um, MJ for this next section. Go ahead. So my name's MJ. I work at Granger Medical Clinic in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, we are actually a multi-specialty clinic, and we have close to 160 providers and ranging over 25 different locations in our valley. So that means that we are pretty much tied to every healthcare system in the state of Utah, um, regardless of what system, uh, healthcare system we have. Um, the difference, the most unique thing about our clinic is that we don't have a healthcare system tied to us. We're outpatient, direct outpatient. So we're waiting on healthcare systems such as hospitals, long-term care um, facilities, skilled nursing facilities, home care, everyone to communicate back to us. Um, we're not aware when our patients are going to the hospital, and um, hospital systems don't know when our patients are going. Um, so, or when our patients actually go to their facility. So, this is the best way for me to describe it. In a perfect world, patient goes to a, a hospital system, the ER. Um, the ER transfers all the communication to the admitting nurse or admitting hospitalist, um, and all that information, brand new medication, is all being streamlined back um, to the next care. So, the, wor the warm handoff is supposed to be taking place. If they're transferring to a skilled nursing facility, same component. Um, proper communication, the warm handoff is taking place. Once they discharge from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting, so back to their primary care or back to their specialist, the perfect world would have all records in their EMR chart. Um, medications are updated. You know exactly what's been going on with them, what issues they have, and why they're being seen. An appointment is scheduled. However, this is really realistically what is happening. There is no proper um, chain of command. There is no communication expectations being held in the healthcare system, whether that's in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. Um, I think at once patients discharge home and are in home care, that's where the issues happen. These providers, specialists, primary care are getting orders from home care, um, and they have no idea who signed them on. They had no idea why, um, what these patients are on home care for, and um, they're no longer overseeing their provider patients. So there's no link, um, regardless of what medications are being changed throughout the system, there's just no perfect system in place. So this is a perfect example of a broken healthcare system. So what happens when that patient is in front of um, a primary care or a specialist? Um, in a 15-minute window. So this is exactly what happens, is they're completely in the dark. They have no idea. So the patient's there hoping that, you know, they're going to get the care they need to get better, um, and they're losing trust and confidence in the provider because they have no idea what is going on with them. They have no, they have no records. They have, um, they have no idea what medications they've been on. And for the provider, it's it's hard for them as well. They can't provide the best quality of care as they know how, and so that um, brings to a distrust in our healthcare system. So, so what's the missing component in patient care? There's just no communication to from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting currently in place. I think there's applications being built. I think as technology advances, um, we're expecting these technology systems um, applications to communicate, but. I think we're missing, um, missing that piece component is that communication, just the form handoff, the phone call, an encrypted message to do the verbal communication, what's going on with the patient. So this is the best way for me to explain how our, the reality of electronic medical record. Recently had to go to South Africa, had to get new adapters for a cell phone, a computer, and then you know a hair dryer. And if you plug in the wrong adapter, your appliance fries, right? So this is a perfect way to explain how the EMR system in a hospital setting, a skilled nursing facility, home care, um, even an LTAC, a behavioral health facility, everyone has a different operating system. And um, how do you find all the adapters? Um, you know, I know that I went to several different targets and found different adapters for one country. So in, in the end, I bought six different adapters and had no idea which um, one fit for each appliance. So 
You know, and I guess in a way, um, the best way for us to really streamline this advanced healthcare system as it advances, but it's very complex, um, is taking the time and finding the right adapters and us on an outpatient perspective, taking the time to learn um, how hospitals operate, how skilled nursings operate, um, how home care operates. And for us to be able to do that, we're working collaboratively. Um, we're no longer working as an individual group. We're a collaborative community um, forming this new healthcare system to, uh, to ensure that their communication is streamlined. So, um, so how do you link everything together? This is, the best way for us is to, um, to explain it is developing a transitional care model. So at Granger, we actually um, implemented a model and we just sent an outpatient perspective into each of these healthcare settings and trying to find the adapter that fits best in each system. Um, we've learned, it took us, I mean, it wasn't, it took a long time. It took us about three years to really understand how hospitals operate, how skilled nursings operate. Um, so the best way we knew how was to really focus on two things is enhance your communication model and accommodating to everybody's workflows um, and ensuring that you're finding a champion in every system, whether that's a hospital system, finding a champion in the skilled nursing world, um, finding a champion in home care, and establishing a great relationship in personal and professional relationships. That's what we focus on most is communication. So linking that system together has really helped us to enhance um, the quality of care that we provide back to our patients. And secondly, um, collaborative partnerships. No longer are we working on our own. We are a community on a global level. Everyone's trying to um, come together to share best practices, and um, this is the best way for our, us to succeed is when we, our patients succeed. So I think that we, it's been great to hear about the outpatient side from a multi-specialty clinic, and now I think it's a great opportunity to hear from the hospital side of things to see what the inpatient facilities are trying to do with regards to technology and those great transitions of care back to home. So hello, I'm Perry Gee. I'm a nurse scientist at Dignity Health. We are the largest healthcare provider in California, and uh, we also have facilities in Arizona and Nevada. Um, we have about 40 hospitals. Um, the reason I put this, this slide up, keep calm, I'm compliant, is because last year at Medicine X, we had a lot of discussion about the term compliant and the compliant patient and how much we disliked that word. And I certainly dislike that word. Um, and, and there's another word, though, that I am starting to dislike just as much, and that word is adherence, right? Um, our patient... Um, this, this patient, for example, did not adhere to her medication regime, and so she was readmitted to this hospital. Or how come this patient has not been adherent to uh, what, what I ordered for them? And, and we're seeing that all the time. But this person in the hospital is not necessarily 100% responsible for being adherent, right? Where is our responsibility as healthcare providers and as researchers and others who are interested in, in her well-being? I think there probably needs to be a partnership in the word adherence. I wish we didn't have to use it. Um, in this circumstance, they've, they've said to me, you know, what our main problem with readmissions for patients with heart failure at, at, um, at our facilities is um, medication adherence. But what does that really mean? And what is our responsibility for this person when she leaves? So um, what, you know, what I'm concerned about is how do we make sure that um, she ha is engaged? And, and at lunchtime, I was talking with, with uh, Hugo Campos, and he said, Perry, the word is not engaged. He said, you, the, you, we can't use engage. Engagement means different things to different people. He said, what about her goals? What does she want to accomplish? Does she want to be able to walk up the stairs or walk to the grocery store? Uh, you know, what do we need to do? And I need to partner with her as a healthcare organization to help her meet those goals. So I'm not really gonna think so much about engagement as I am about her being as healthy as she can possibly be. And one of the things that we're doing in Dignity Health, I wanna talk about three different technologies that we're using right now that might help people attain their goals that they can achieve the most healthy or optimal um, uh, uh, form of health that they can have. So let's take a look at this very first one, which is, it has to do with medications. So one of the problems I mentioned is medication, um, uh, people taking their medications, are they able to purchase them? Are they taking them at the right times? And, uh, and what does that mean? Well, one of the things that we could do as an organization is do a better job at sending them home with uh, more knowledge about the medications that they use. 
So we're sending them home right now with a sheet that looks like this, but it's also uh, attached to a, a website so that they can launch that website when they get home and have uh, even greater access. So this is an example of a, of a medication list that we would be uh, uh, sharing with the patient through a, it's through a company called Meducation. Uh, this attaches to our Cerner electronic health record system. Uh, the nurse or the pharmacist or the physician or whoever launches this app, it, it, or it's not an app, launches this, this feature, it opens. We can give the patient now this very customized view. Instead of getting a great big giant stack of papers with a whole bunch of information about their medicines, they can get something that very simple that says you need to take your medicine at lunchtime or at dinner time or at bedtime. And if they need more information about that, we also give them access to the site so that they can launch and maybe watch a video on how to use an inhaler or some other kind of medication device. So we're in the early stages of implementing this system-wide right now. I think we've implemented it at, at just one of our regions. And um, we're starting to already see uh, increased use and increased success. So we'll soon we'll be measuring, uh, is this making a difference in um, patients' lives? The next thing that we're working on is what we call, and I wish I would have thought about the name before I talked with Hugo today at lunch, but we call this IPET for Interactive Patient Engagement Technologies. Interactive Patient Engagement Technologies are something we've implemented, implemented throughout all of our 40 hospitals. We're in the early stages of that implementation as well. And to you as a patient, when you walk in the room, you may just think of it as a television. But it's really a television that's kind of on steroids. So yes, it has television, it has music, and it has movies, all those things that we can use for distraction therapy, which by the way, we've have done some unique studies related to distraction therapy using this, this technology. We can have the patient view the technology through a television or through an um, iPad. So when we're in the, in the emergency departments, they are, are given an iPad to use to uh, make their way through this. But more important in here is uh, other information. So for example, the patient can have access to their medication list. So they can look at that medication list with the nurse, with the providers, and um, start to make some sense of the medication list and help them reconcile it with us. They also have access to their plan of care. So we've seen a few different uh, applications that relate to plan of care since we've been in here uh, over the last couple days. And this is another chance for them to take a look at that plan of care and see what it might be useful. They can learn how to message their providers in this system. So they can send a message to their physician or maybe to the dietitian or someone else in the hospital to get information that they need in the hospital. And last, we're starting to give them a look into the patient portal because what we would really like is for people to be able to go home and already be familiar with what it's like to launch into a portal from their home so they can communicate with their pro providers and be more actively involved in their own care. Now, this has not been without difficulty, right? So for this woman in, in this picture, she's awake, she's able to, to look at the screen. But what if you're a person who has recently had uh, surgery and you're still recovering from anesthesia and you're tired and you don't feel like engaging with this equipment and then all of a sudden you're being asked to go home, right? And so this is one of the, the problems that we had during the implementation. Oh, this is great, but not every single patient is ready for it. And also what we found during the implementation is the staff weren't ready to figure out how to work it into their workflow. Uh, this is a new thing. Uh, we've never had this kind of stuff before. I've never had the chance to go to an online medication list with my patients before, or a discharge plan where we look at that together in an online format. So this has been kind of new for us, and um, it's worked very well in certain units. So for example, in the OB units, uh, a normal vaginal delivery patient can watch their videos. We can interact with the, with the patient that way. They have a, the opportunity to watch it, and by the way, Anything that is observed or, or, or um, completed through the portal is then documented in the electronic health record. So it actually, it could be a time saver. It changes the way we teach. Um, uh, instead of walking into the room and saying, uh, I'm gonna teach you now about A, we can say, hey, did you watch the video of, about breastfeeding? What kinds of questions do you have? And so it changes the way that we're, we're teaching. This is an evolution in process. There are lots of these systems going in throughout the United States. 
Uh, they have a lot of different brands and we're using two or three different kinds of systems that uh, deliver this kind of uh, information. So hopefully we'll have more research uh, out about that uh, very soon. And then our last uh, area that I'd like to talk about is, is using an Internet of Thing device, uh, Internet of Things device. And this is a device that attaches to a rescue inhaler. It's made by a company called Propeller. Um, I've never personally seen the device itself, but we have completed research in our facilities using this device with another team. And what we found was is that we, we started doing research uh, with children and asthma. We've recently published a paper uh, about that, and if any of you are interested in that, please contact me and I'll make arrangements for you to, to uh, find that, that paper. Um, but we found that this is also working very well for people with COPD. And here's how this works. You attach a little Bluetooth device to this rescue inhaler. That Bluetooth device uh, communicates with an app on a phone. That app then is able to send uh, alerts to a provider team based on a certain set of parameters. And, but it does more than just that. So every time you take uh, a dose of your medication. It records the time and the geolocation and the weather conditions and atmospheric pressure and the pollen counts and the um, air quality and, it, it gen and probably more uh, data as well. It generates all that, puts all that data together and then we can start looking for patterns. Um, is this person hitting their inhaler more than they usually do? Does this person always use their inhaler when they are at location B or location A? Is there a, a reason why the inhaler gets used more often uh, related to air quality or pollen counts or something like that? And then the providers, instead of waiting and meeting the patient in the emergency department and, and perhaps having a patient go into a hospitalization, they can call the patients at home and intervene early which I really like that idea. So they call them up and they say, hey, what's going on? We notice you're hitting your inhaler more, than, more often than you usually do. Are there some problems? Maybe there's something we can do. Maybe we can have an office visit or something to avoid uh, future hospitalizations. We really think there's gonna be promise in this and I understand that this propeller company is now looking at more and more uh, applications uh, for uh, something like this to occur. So we really feel good about uh, the future of using the Internet of Things, and we want to add more of those kinds of things as they impact transitions of care, as our patients leave the hospital and go somewhere into the community. The last thing I want to talk about, and it's really not very easily, easy to see the slide, but, but some colleagues and I recently published a, um, a systematic review of systematic reviews related to apps uh, for... Um, uh, the, the self-management of diabetes. And this was in the, the Journal of uh, Science and uh, Diabetes Technology uh, just a, a couple months ago. And the key thing that we found was that a, a complete feedback loop, a complete communication feedback loop was required if you wanted to improve someone's A1C. And we're not the first people to find this. Um, uh, in 2008, uh, Holly Jemison found that in her uh, her study that she did for AHRQ. She found that for any kind of chronic illness, if a complete feedback loop was consistent within the application, then um, the app worked better, the patient had better outcomes. And we certainly found this in our study as well. You need to have two-way communication and you need to have a follow-up. It's a simple, courteous follow-up that we've always known is the right thing to do. If a patient gives us some information, we analyze that information as providers or as a provider team or as an algorithm, and we give them a response. And it would be best if we could give them a personalized response. And so that's kind of what we found in this particular study, the same thing, that the importance of a feedback loop in any of these kinds of technology, that patients can't just always go to a black hole. There has to be some communication with the provider team. That's so great to hear about how not only um, are we trying to 
to help improve the transition of care, but also help to improve the readmission of hospitalizations. One of the things that I'd like to ask MJ is, can you tell us a little bit about the successes of the program that you've built over the last three years and some of the challenges that you faced while doing so? Yeah, absolutely, that's a great question. I think um, in the past three, three or so years, um, we've experienced more challenges than we have successes. However, I think we're getting to a point where we're seeing so much more success because the community is more involved and collaborative with us. Um, some of the successes has been reducing readmission rates. Um, I think that's been huge. It's the primary care and specialists on an outpatient perspective taking the driver's seat and becoming the quarterback again. So we're identifying our patients in the hospital systems and um, following them as they um, through their whole care transition. So one point or another, we'll send a representative in to their facilities wherever they're at in an inpatient setting and letting them, reminding them that their primary care knows they're here and they're gonna follow up with you as soon as you discharge. And so that just gives, um, I think in a way, hope for a patient to know that they're not alone in their healthcare journey. Um, so some of those are the successes. We've been able to identify a lot of patients can't come in within that transitional care window by CMS guidelines, um, which is in that 14-day window. And so we've been able to evolve our program to sending practitioners back into the home if you can't come to us, let us come to you. And that's opened up to a lot of more opportunities as well for our patients to truly succeed, um, whether in whichever care setting they're in. Um, challenges though, there I mean, there's so many, the healthcare system's still broken, and I think unfortunately, technology continues to fail us. You know, one day you wake up, you have a great system in place, and then the system goes down. <laughs> and so now what happens to these patients? For a day, you're gonna have to lose track of them and hopefully pick up by the next day. Um, and I think in other ways is going into a hospital setting or a skilled nursing facility setting and kind of changing the way that they've been operating for so long. I think um, the most dangerous phrase that we've heard in the past three years is that we've always done it this way. And so I, I've heard that consistently and I think in a lot of ways, you know, we are, we're going to fail as healthcare leaders and we'll fail our patients if we continue to think on that mentality. So those are some of the challenges I think we face. And um, what's, what's great, though, is that we are um, thriving on some of the successes and we're continuing to see that our patients are um, really getting those tools to succeed. So it's, those challenges have become more of an opportunity for us to continue to build and evolve. So um, as far as the challenges go, I can't really say that it's a bad thing. <laughs> Well, I think that challenges help us to identify what we need to do different. So, <clears throat> Perry, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you've faced and maybe how you have overcome them or how you hope to overcome them. Sure. Well, I, I can tell you, as I mentioned <clears throat> before, one of the challenges is, is dealing with workflow of the clinicians and these new applications. If we're sending them, if we're constantly giving them new applications. They have to have value added, and they have to be something that people can fit into their workflow, into their daily flow. And so when immediately when we start trying to put out these new television systems, uh, people weren't, the, the nursing staff who was really at the intersection of, of the patient and the, and the technology um, didn't necessarily embrace it. They had not been taught how to use it. They had no idea how to fit it into their workflow. It looked like it was just one more thing. And it really all boils down to the way things are implemented. The good news about that is, is that we took our research team and we went into four or five different hospitals and we did a qualitative research where we embedded ourselves with the nurses for days at a time, looking how they use this equipment looking what their needs were, what their training needs were, and now we've completely reconstructed the training evolved about uh, around how to implement these systems. That's changed everything. That then has drifted over to other technology trainings that we're, we're doing in our facility. Now, we're not ending there, we're still, we're circling back and we're continuing to evaluate how those implementations are going. Recently, I went into a hospital uh, in one of our locations that uh, the patient room just happened to be set up that they have three beds and two televisions. Well, that doesn't work so good if you're trying to send videos to specific patients, right? Those kinds of things had not been sorted out necessarily during the, during the process, and uh, our team was able to identify that and intervene early uh, to, to assist in that, that process. One of the positive things, and it really is 
kind of less related to transition of care, but, but a positive aspect of some of this technology is um, we were able to use iPads in the pre-surgical area for pediatric cases for distraction therapy. And we uh, weren't quite at the point where we were gonna use less uh, pre-surgical sedation, but we did find that it did reduce the anxiety both in the children and in the parents, which is important at both levels. So we really feel like even the distraction therapy pieces associated with that interactive patient engagement technologies uh, can help us improve care. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up pediatrics. I think that when we think about transitions of care, we often think of the older patient who might have several chronic conditions who's going into the hospital often, but we know that there are other people who go in the hospital. So MJ, tell me a little bit about other types of populations that you might see in a transition of care setting. Yeah, well, for our program, I mean, we've had a variety of patients. There's, you know, we can do transitional care on NICU patients. Obviously, that's going to be very difficult um, for you to identify what names they're under. You know, they're brand new to the world, and they have, um, you know, they still are under their mother's name, sometimes in a, um, with hyphenated. So it's hard to find them in the system. But you can, um, you know, we've had a, huge, a large population of um, pediatric patients that, um, that might have mental health issues, and that finding it in a system an EMR system that is private. It's not a public setting where you can just, you know, sign up with a doctor's signature and say, give me access to the system and I can search any patient. So I think those are um, things to continue to look into to ensure how you can continue to bridge those gaps in those populations. So I think the best um, recommendation is really to continue to advance on the populations and doing it, your care transition programs, um, whatever you have in place for every population. And that's how you'll continue to be an expert and really serve the entire community that you're, um, you're practicing in. Absolutely. I'm wondering, you've talked about some different technologies. One is, you know, these apps that are in the hospital system, and this other one is kind of how you're searching to find these patients to um, kind of break down the silos of all the different EMRs. Tell me a little bit about how you think your technology specifically has changed that patient-provider relationship. You know, I think um, if anything, it's, it's enhanced it. I think that we are able to, you know, manually go into a system and pull the records that offer that communication for our providers and our practitioners to really take care of the patients the best way they know how with, you know, for someone else that's involved in their healthcare for within a three-day window. Usually patients are in a hospital system for three days and they get transitioned to the next, you know, the next healthcare journey. And then they're probably in there for another 15 days in a skilled nursing facility. So once they get back, you know, everything has changed, but I think um, as long as we have access to those systems or have a communication component to get access to those systems, um, we are able to provide all of that back to the primary care or the specialists and then um, for them to review it and then regurgitate that back to the patient. Um, I think that's been everything. I think that's improved the relationship that now the trust is back um, in their, their provider and in the healthcare system that it's no longer failing our patients. It's, um, you know, the streamline, but it's unfortunate. I think it's all manual labor <laughs> at the moment. At one point or another, there will be an interface. There's obviously, um, I think every state has a central health information exchange or a CHI system, um, but that also, uh, you kind of have to dissect that to ensure that you're capturing the, the most of your population. There could be times it's just one hospital system in your entire state. So it continued to advance on that, but that's where you usually would start to, in order to get that communication of which patients are actually in a hospital setting and when they're discharging. Well, and I know that some cheese actually require healthcare systems to pay in mm -hmm. to the CHI system, and so smaller clinics might not have the capacity to do something like that. Um, Perry, tell me a little bit about how you think some of the technologies have helped um, change that patient-provider relationship? Well, I think I'll, I'll kind of segue off something that MJ just said, and that was the, the term trust, which is really important. So the fact that we can all now share a medication list in the hospital where it was, it's not isolated, away in the, locked away in some electronic health record or in some pharmacy somewhere, patients now feel like they have a sense of trust. This is my medication list, and that's new for them. You know, And um, even if they aren't able to participate uh, in that, in the acute care setting, the family members are also becoming engaged with this interactive uh, technology system. So that's one. The other thing is, is that we're finding an enhanced communication as sort of a, um, a, a, a 
just sort of a, a, an extra addition that's going on with this use of these rescue inhalers. The physician is more connected to their patient and the patient is more connected with what's going on around them. If they choose to, the patient can look at the app and also start looking at trends in their own health. Um, and we're starting to see lots of patients do that. And, and with that, then it has been fewer admissions and uh, better control of both asthma and COPD. I completely agree with that aspect of trust. When, I, when a patient of mine comes to see me and asks whether or not I've known that they've been in the hospital, if I have known about it and I can relay what I know about that discharge, there's just a, a sense of calm with that patient that, wow, my healthcare provider actually knows what's, gone, what's happened. And unfortunately, that's not always the case where there's these different um, systems that people are going through that aren't always communicating back to the provider. And so I appreciate all the great work that is being done. One of the questions that I want to ask before we take some audience questions is um, all of these great new systems that are being implemented, do you think that you've really fixed healthcare with it? That's a great, I mean, I can take that first. I think um, that's a great question and I, I don't agree, I mean, absolutely not. There's no way that our program has helped solve the world's problems and the healthcare system. It's, it's broken, but I think platforms like this, MedEx, um, providing us with an opportunity to, to share a message um, and then gathering everyone together to really to build a foundation for us to understand and be transparent of why it's broken and really working together in different aspects. And I think I heard a, a saying just that if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's exactly what this, you know, MedEx has brought us together to be able to do. So, so no, but it's, I think we're on our way. <laughs> Perry, the same question. Same question. And, and we definitely haven't, haven't solved everything. But but it's really helping us improve the journey, right? <clears throat> we're starting to narrow that road and we're starting to get on the same road, which is really good. I think one of the things that is a prime directive for us right now is trying to figure out ways that we can improve, um, I, gosh, I'm now so hesitant to use the word patient engagement, but the way that we can improve um, patient engagement, patient understanding, health literacy among our, our patients. And we have a very diverse uh, a group of patients. And so how can, can we do that together as a team? That's, that's one thing. And then two, we're trying to bring all of these technologies together into a place that we call the digital home. And the digital home is in development r literally right now. And, and the, the vision is that it's a one-stop shop, a portal-like one-stop shop for, for patients to be able to go in and find health information, information about their own health, uh, and, and really have everything there, videos, um, uh, medication lists, all those things in, in one particular area, uh, a, a, an expanded version, if you will, of a, of a patient portal. And so that is, uh, is happening right now, and I'm really excited to see how that evolves over time. Absolutely. We have uh, some time for some questions from the audience. <laughs> we'll have a microphone come over. I love this panel. Thank you, guys. Um, so my name is Liz Salmi. I am a e-patient here. I also work for Open Notes, and I have a couple questions for you, Perry. And I've tweeted at you before, so thanks yes, for writing me back. Um, uh, so I was really excited to see what you're doing in the hospital, where you have the screen, and then people can watch TV, but they can also like log into their patient portal. And I know you've only tested this out at a few sites, so it's not everywhere throughout Dignity. But in the locations you have tested this out, um, are what was your portal registration like in those areas already? And then are you seeing an increased registration on the portal as people can engage with it straight from their hospital room? I don't know the answer to that, but that's a perfect research question for our team. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I don't know the, an the answer to that. And I think we're too early to see those changes. Um, the, the good news is, is that we are starting, uh, you know, we do keep a track of our portal use currently. And so we will be tracking the, any increases. So thank you for that question. It's, that's a perfect question. I don't want to forget about that. So. I, I can answer that from a clinical perspective. There's no research data behind it. But every time that we've had, um, and this is outpatient, but every time a medical assistant has trained a patient in the diabetes center that I work at, um, how to log into that portal and not just printing off the instruction sheet, but actually getting on with them. I've actually seen an increase in communication that they actually know what to do. And 
in the patients that I take care of, it seems like there, there's more willingness to do so. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Hi there, my name's Francine. I'm an e-patient here. Um, the metrics that you use to drive improvements to transitional care, like hospital readmissions, medication adherence, but are there other metrics that you're looking at to push this trend forward? And I'm thinking more about those patients who have caregivers that are pushing them to take their medications properly or taking care of them in the home and allowing them to not get readmitted, but the stress on them is still causing, is still something for concern that we should look at. Yeah, I can take that question. Uh, with our model, we actually have built a communication model in conjunction to a transitional care program with home care partners. So it's very important to collaborate with home care partners because a lot of patients who fell or have questions are usually in the home. They have a fall in the home because they're not taking their medications or maybe their bed's too high to get into their wheelchair. There's multiple, so it's important to establish a great communication model and holding them accountable to, um, and we're measuring, as far as metrics go, um, we're asking them to communicate everything, any health change status, even if they discharge, they're doing well, they met all goals, to communicate everything about that patient back to the primary care, or back to the specialist. And as far as metrics go, we measure the communication touch points. What we have learned is that, you know, in the study that we just recently did is um, measuring those communication touch points versus our home care partners versus non-home care partners, and it really has proven to reduce hospitalizations um, and enhance the quality of care. And in the end, the primary care knows exactly, their home care is the eyes and ears in the home, um, and so, and to the primary care, and so they, our primary cares know exactly what's going on in the patient. If at one point the patient needs to be seen for an onset of a UTI, feels like they need to go to an IER, um, we can get a nurse practitioner out there to see them, or a PA to see them, or another physician to go out in the home. So. As far as metrics, we're, we're really enhancing what we're doing um, and then hopefully coming up with more efficient practices and metrics to be able to measure them to make sure that they're really improving patient's care overall. Well, and it sounds like there might be great opportunities. I heard you say the word caregiver, and I know that that's um, something that they're really interested in looking at on the national level. Um, I think that caregiver metrics is a great idea with regards to um, not just the patient's quality of life, but what is the quality of life of this caregiver that might have this extra stress in addition to maybe a job that they have or children that they take care of. Um, I think that's a great metric that we should probably be considering in the future as we, as we kind of delve into more research. Yeah, I think we, what, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just one more thought on that. On um, It's so important to have some type of pharmacy team involved in your primary care practice. And so there's times our home care understands the model and says, hey, this patient just needs extra education, a little bit more push um, to be adherence to their medications. And so um, those are things that they reach out to us on as well. And then we measure, we do follow up care to make sure, now do you understand your medication components, um, your regimen, do you have any questions now? And I think that's helped to improve them in the home as well. We have time for one more question. Let me ask um, one last final question for everybody. <laughs> um, tell me, what are your hopes for the future? So you've talked about what you've done now. Think in the future. What? piece is missing? What could we be doing differently? I kind of think about my, my aunt who, had, who was deaf and has communication issues. Um, we can't call her on the phone. And so what things could be different for maybe special populations that we're not accessing right now? Can I jump in on something sure, really quick? Yeah. The one thing that we're doing at Dignity Health that I really like around these technology implementations is we have, um, we're, we have patient focus groups. And I know lots of places have patient focus groups, but we have patient focus groups where we bring pa people together and uh, we in, have them engage with the technology and then they help us learn about how they could best use it, which I think is, is really good from, a, from an informatics standpoint. Um, we haven't done that enough in the past, in my opinion. But so we do that. So with these, these um, at least the first two things, the education program and the patient uh, uh, engagement programs, both of those we had patient involvement when we developed the training for both the patients and for the nurses. 
Um, I don't know if there's the best answer for this one. As far um, I mean, for a program, I think the best way to see what the long-term future looks like is to continue to evolve your programs and don't ever just consider like, I think we're, we finally have come to a point where it's good enough. Um, it's never going to be good enough, continue to evolve and really identify the gaps that, um, and that's where we have identified as, um, adding on um, Pediatric, um, pediatric patients and identifying that, you know what, they are a different system in uh, the state of Utah and you don't get access to their records um, as timely as you get it for you know, uh, older adults. So I think as long as, um, to, to see the long-term future is to continue to evolve your programs and never really um, staying that we're at a point where it's just good enough. So hopefully that's a good ending. Um, model for everybody is just to continue to progress and push healthcare forward. Absolutely. So we're done with the status quo. Move forward. Thanks, guys. <laughs>